All right, folks, we're three weeks away and counting. We've got Nebraska football with Brian Toll of Corn Nation on SB Nation, and we would love to break this thing down, Brian, as we get close to the season. Let's go through these personnel units. Brian does a nice job for us uh, talking up the Huskers. So let's start with the scrimmage that just occurred yesterday and kind of your thoughts and, and takeaway. Offense, offense finally showed up and said, hello, how are we? Um, biggest name off the offense last Last night was Stanley Morgan, the, the freshman wideout from uh, New Orleans area. Had three touchdowns in the scrimmage. Uh, looked really good. Has looked really good. Um, part of that is Nebraska's top receiving core have been injured and out. A few practices to morning personnel, Jordan Westerkamp, Sam Birch have been injured. Not really bad injuries, just but stuff that keeps them out of practices here and there. Uh, Morgan's been the biggest beneficiary of that uh, so far this camp. Uh, looked real good. Tommy Armstrong had a nice – Long touch, uh, long run of about 50 yards that Mike Riley got tickled, said he hadn't seen that in 15 years of football from his team. Um, really kind of improvement for the offense. It sounds like the offense had struggles throughout seven on seven and started camp last week. Um, there were also, there were still issues, uh, you know, defensively wise, giving up big plays uh, from, uh, from the linebacking perspective and the secondary perspective. Uh, who knows if that's a, thing because the wide receivers are that good or the defensive backs just had a bad day. Um, really more consistency what Mike Riley said he wanted at the end of the practice yesterday. Um, sounds like special teams went really well. Uh, they had a blocked uh, extra point. Um, a couple big booms by Sam Foltz. Uh, 105 plays. Nebraska got out a lot, a lot of things. Uh, sounds like your top two running backs are to replace Amir Abdullah. Charles Newby, who we knew would be there, but also Mikhail Wilbon, the the redshirt freshman uh, really kind of sounds like split the first and second first team carries. Uh, some big runs, uh, not a lot of big runs. That could be the defensive line uh, was that good. The good offensive line could be that iffy right now. Uh, but overall, after the first week of scrimmage, some good things. Obviously, some stuff to work on. But nine days in the practice, nine days out of thirty in the practice, kind of what you expect from a from a team getting a first year head coach with new coordinators across the board. So, yeah, talking about a first-year head coach, we talked a number of times during the offseason and specifically in spring practice about the Riley difference, the difference in Mike Riley versus Bo Pelini. Do we see that at all during during August practice? I know you can't be there. They're closed off. But are we hearing any any differences? Uh, some media you know, some media are allowed to watch certain practices. Uh, I haven't been there, but the gist I've gotten on some, of, some players is uh, – that you know, Riley practices a little longer. There's no two days, two a days anymore, and I, I get that because you you work so long in summer, conditioning and running that there's no need to run them out in pads and run two hour long practices, hour and a half long practices a day. Um, what it sounds like sounds like it's a lot more relaxed. Uh, people are saying it's a lot more actually um, organized. Uh, th there's you know meetings start on time. This is quotes from players from Big Ten media days. It's, the spring ball and everything. Meetings start on time. Uh, you know, things are relaxed. Not more. There's not a lot of tension. Uh, media has the same rules as they do did last year with Bo, but there's no sense of somebody watching over you, seeing if you're touching your phone. You know, Riley says, "Hey, don't tweet. Don't talk about practice until we're over. Um, don't record." And you know, everybody's like, "Good. We'll be good with that." And everybody's really kind of done well with that. Um, I think there's also. You know, everybody kind of thought going from Bo Pelini and uh, Tim Beck to Danny Langston from Mike Riley that Mike Riley would implore just go nothing but West Coast offense. Well, last night we tended to saw, see that, you know, the running game by the quarterback still in shape. Uh, Armstrong is still a guy whose strength is running. He can't throw it good, but he his strength is running more and more. Uh, Mike Riley has called it trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. He's not going to try to do that. He's going to use his players that – uh, what his players can do well as advantages of the weaknesses. Uh, there's no reason to try to make, you know, a, go 60-40 pass to run. If he, if he has to run 70% of the time this year, he has to run 70% of the time this year on first down. Um, second and third down have to be predictable maybe on passing. But, hey, Mike Riley's going to make it work. Defensively, you know, you're looking at a pretty good secondary, a really good defensive line and a very young, very inexperienced linebacking crew that needs to get better to make this defense work. Uh, sounds like that's happening. Sounds like the 
what what's going on is you know the best players are playing. It's kind of interesting interesting concept, I believe. Maybe other teams use it across America. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, you know, best the best players they can play are playing. And there's you know if and they made a point to say, hey, if if a freshman can help us, a freshman's going to play. Stanley Morgan is in that boat. Uh, guys like. Uh, uh, the the young the kid the linebacker kid who came in early out of Arizona he's going to play a bunch. Um, there's a lot of things that need to, need to happen for Nebraska to get to a, a next level um, this year. And everybody thinks it's a, it's a uh, rebuilding year, but it's not. Same players as last year's team that wasn't really bad except for when it got to November. So, you know, Mike Riley's going to Mike Riley's made a point to say, hey, we're going to take what worked and make it better. And, uh, you know, there, there's definitely no need to think that we're reinventing the wheel here. Maybe on defense with the, with schemes and such, but other than that, we're not really going to – we're not really going to uh, reinvent anything at Nebraska. Not bad, especially if they play the way they did in the fourth quarter uh, in the Holiday Bowl against USC. So in looking at the Big Ten media coverage, Big Ten network coverage from Nebraska camp, Mike Riley made the comment that he just wants the quarterback to, he has taught the quarterbacks in particular and the wide receivers that, hey, if we have a decent pocket and that wide receiver gets any kind of separation, runs his route correctly, that ball needs to be on target 100% of the time. If the plot pocket's clean, and we know it's not going to be most of the time, but on those plays, those plays have to be completed. It looks like he's trying to start with the base that this, even though he's going to tailor the offense to the personnel, that he's trying to instill that the, the efficiency of a passing attack and, and trying to achieve that. Definitely. Uh, the weakest thing that – the weakest repertoire in Tommy Armstrong's uh, whole game is the 10 to 20 yard out the 10 to 20 yard slant everything like that you know he, he throws two balls real good a five yard screen and a 50 yard bomb and in the middle has to get a lot better for nebraska especially when you don't have you know the amir abdullahs when you have somebody like a demorning personnel when you have somebody like a jordan westerkamp who makes a living getting those first downs for y'all and it's got to fall on Tommy, and it's made the point. If Tommy can't be the best guy in this offense, you're going to be find someone else. Right now, nobody's really stepped up, however. Uh, Riker 5, your favorite, everybody's favorite, uh, pretty much came clear as the uh, second-string quarterback uh, last night in the scrimmage. A.J. Bush showed some promise, but didn't really kind of – didn't really, you know, everybody looked good, but everybody had bad things. Tommy Armstrong had less bad things. Tommy Armstrong had no turnovers last night during the scrimmage. I think that's probably the biggest thing you can ask out of Tommy. No turnovers, no bad throws, no fumbles and such like that. He's had a problem with both. Um, if Nebraska doesn't turn the ball over, they're pretty good. They, their, their record winning the turnover battle in the last few years is impeccable. Winning the turno turnover battle is a completely different thing. Even minus one hurts Nebraska really bad. So if Armstrong can learn how to make those 15, 20-yard passes that are needed – uh, and not just against, you know, the South Alabamas and the Southern Misses of the world uh, when he needed on the road against Minnesota, against Wisconsin, a team that's Nebraska's own, been owned by, um, against teams like Iowa, you know, last year, in the, he said last year in the Holiday Bowl, he did a really good job opening that offense up and throwing it. It's got to be now an every week thing. Uh, he'll have off weeks, but at the same time, he's got to also have weeks that his off week is better than his off week last year. Uh, Nebraska's got to take the next step. Tommy Armstrong's got to take that step because there are two guys next year coming in right now, Patrick O'Brien and Terry Wilson. One's a dual threat and one's a pure passer. And if Armstrong can't lead him this year, it could very well possibly that next year Armstrong could be second, third string. And that'd be a really weird thing for a three-year starter to become a third-string quarterback all of a sudden. So it, it's up to Tommy to get better. And Mike Riley's correct. You know, the, the, the run game's not going to be there all time. Uh, new – Newer offensive line, newer running backs back there getting the, getting the rotation of the carries. Sometimes you're gonna have to throw the ball to win, especially in the, even in the Big Ten Conference. I know it's I know it goes against a lot of guys' thoughts that you can't just run to win in the Big Ten, but you got to throw the ball well to throw win in the Big Ten as well as well as college football. Yeah, it sounds like Riley's taking a page from Vince Lombardi, who says if you shoot for perfection, nobody can achieve perfection. But if you shoot for perfection, you get excellence. Hey, that's that's pretty darn good. So if Armstrong goes from 
and starts to complete some of those balls. And let's say he goes to 60%. And a lot of the that difference are those 12 yard outs and those continue drives. That makes all the difference in the world. You only have so many possessions. And if you're converting more third downs, let's say just a couple more per game, that can make all the difference in the world. So on the defensive side, Brian, I'm hearing the players say they've got more freedom. They like the system. They're able to play. They're able to use their athleticism uh, under the new defensive coordinator. Malik Collins uh, made some comments about that, and really everybody has. Yeah, uh, the one thing about both system, it worked really well, but you better have known it. It was an encyclopedia, and um, you know Mark Banker's system is more read reactionary. It's excuse me, instead of thinking about it, do it. Instead of, uh, you know, thinking about 10 things, you know, what do you do here, what do you do here? Hey, just play. You know, they've always said, hey, if you're going to make – Mark Banker made a point to say, if you're going to make the mistake, make it 100 miles an hour. Don't outthink yourself. Um, and that that that's interesting, especially coming to the linebacker spot where Trent Bray's kind of made the point of, hey, you know, you guys have had to think and think and think and think. Just go out and play. Go out and do your thing. Blitz, if we call for a blitz, don't worry about where you got to line up and what gap and what everything like that. That's got to come secondary. Just, you know, what? just do it. Just go out and make the play. And uh, that's something big that has worked on Nebraska's level. And it looks, it sounds like it worked out every well, you know, last night maybe kind of an aberration. But uh, year, the last few years it's been a really kind of cerebral type of defense where you've had to put yourself in the right position and think about every single thing you've done. This year, uh, Banker, Bray, Brian Stewart, those guys just want you to get get the play done. Go play. You know, we'll figure it out. We'll figure out what you need to do on the sideline, figure out what you need in the film room. But just go play. And that's a great – that that that's going to be interesting to see how that works cut through the season. Brian Toll joins us from Corn Nation. Brian, I'm going to throw out a few uh, what I consider to be most likely weak spots, and, and you can address them. A thin offensive line replacing four starters. D end linebacker looks a little thin, and it looks like you might have to play a couple of true freshmen in the secondary. Yeah, um, a- a- Avery Anderson and Eric Lee are two really good guys from Colorado that are redshirt freshmen that may come up and have to play. Um, it- it's going to be interesting. Uh, there's really only one uh, known guy back there as Byron and Cockrell that played kind of a nickel peso type of thing for Bo Pelini's defense last year. It's it's going to be interesting how Josh Kalou comes across and plays. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, if, if they're going to play – are they going to play more nickel? Are they going to play base coverages more? Um, really, Stewart's kind of kind of had that little taste of the Big Ten, but at the same time, you know, you're going to face more teams that either you're going to be a spread team or you're going to be not. And it seemed like Nebraska was bet a better spread defense than it was a base defense the last couple of years, especially against a team like Wisconsin, where you know they just lined up in the eye and it was a four three four and go at it. And it seemed like Wisconsin kind of kicked everybody, kicked Nebraska during that. But when you wanted to spread things out, Nebraska's nickels was nickel uh, package was seemed to be a lot better. Maybe that's because they're taking less taking linebackers off, but. Yeah, youth is going to have to happen there, especially linebacker. Dedrick Young, is a, like I said, was a guy from Arizona that's going to have to step in. Uh, there's Muhammad Berry, Tyron Ferguson, or true freshman linebackers that are in the fray that are going to be there uh, playing. Um, the back seven is going to be really young for Nebraska. Uh, you got you to gotta kind of trust what you, you kind of got to find out to see what you have to uh, really know how good you are. And we'll, we'll have a good idea after the non-conference schedule, especially against uh, – a throwing team like Miami and a uh, guy like Taysom Hill and BYU. You set me up well right there. Uh, that's my final question about the schedule. So the Big Ten has it where you play two out of the seven from the other division and you play them home and home and then you switch up. So it's Michigan State again, lucky you, and it's Rutgers. And also I got to credit Nebraska, whoever's in charge of this playing two toughies, you look across the nation, it's typically one tough Power 5 conference team on the schedule. You've got Miami and you've got BYU. So does it appear pretty tough, fair? Well, any thoughts about the schedule? I think BYU is a fair opponent. Um, you know, we're going to have – both teams are going to have suspensions. 
to come in. Uh, not sure who Nebraska's is. It's going to be five guys, one defensive starter. Who it is, we don't know. BYU is going to have suspensions coming down. It's going to be coming the next two weeks, obviously. Uh, I think BYU is about as fair as you can get. BYU could have arguably the best quarterback Nebraska is going to see all year in the first game. Um, that's no slight to the uh, Brad Kai out of Miami, but to be honest, uh, would you rather Brad Kai or Taysom Hill? And that's a great question. Uh, I'd rather have Taysom just personally me, which you know is going to get a little more. Um, it, it's it's a fair, you know, you start off with a, a toughie at home, then you get a little easier at home with South Alabama, and then you go on the road, your first true road test in a stadium in a hot, sticky, human environment against Miami. Um, the only saving grace for Nebraska is that, hey, you know, they don't really fill up their stadium very well, so how many, how much red is going to be in that, in uh, Sunlight Stadium? Uh, and everybody says, oh, Miami's going to show up. Well, we don't know that. It's not Florida State. You know, they're not keeping it in the state. And then a team against Southern Miss that is not horrible. I mean, they're a little better than they have been. Uh, there's, there probably will be better than a couple years ago when Nebraska played them and they went over for the season. And then you go right at it. You go right at Wisconsin to start off your Big Ten uh, schedule. And that's going to be that's gonna be interesting to see. But Nebraska's definitely trying to schedule better. Uh, Oregon comes on the slate for two years starting next year. Oh, geez, Lord. Going to Austin is going to be probably one of those bucket list things for some Nebraska fans. Um, Tennessee's down the road. Oklahoma's down the road. Um, it's going to be interesting how ha- what happens. Uh, you know, Nebraska's not shading down, and the Big, Big Ten itself is not shading down. You know, Wisconsin's going to open in their sh- open in their show in Arlington against uh, the consensus number one in Alabama. Well, not a consensus number one, but everybody thinks they should be there. Um, Minnesota's hosting. T- you're going to have TCU up in the Twin Cities here, uh, I believe week two, if I remember right. It, it's it's really kind of interesting to see how the Big Ten's kind of stepped it up a little bit and said, you know what, it's on us to get better. So um, it's on Nebraska to get better as scheduling-wise, and they've taken care of that. South Alabama's the last uh, FBS team they're going to schedule ever probably, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be good to see how they can get through. If they can get through four and zero, Nebraska, and that's going to be a very big surprise, and it's going to be a very good surprise for Nebraska. Uh, two and two is probably bad. Three and one is probably best case scenario, I think, for the Huskers as uh, a non conference team. I don't know. If, I'm pretty sure they beat Wayu. I'm not sure about Miami. I just had to see how Miami reacts at the first couple weeks of the year. So what's going to satisfy you? Is it a win total or is it just seeing how the team plays on the field? And, and you, you could be satisfied with seven and five, but see a nine and three that's not satisfying. You know what I mean? Are you going to look at the win total period or is it going to be something that you need to see on the field out of f- first year head coaches program? A, a lot of guy, a lot of people that wanted Bo Pelini to stay at Nebraska are going to look at a win total. They're going to look at nine wins because that's what Bo Pelini got. Uh, even with the embarrassing losses, even with the, you know how he reacted. You know the the, the monster, the monster demeanor, and everything like that. They're still going to think nine wins is total because if they don't get nine wins, if it's an eight and four campaign, they're going to say, "Why do we fire a bow if we set this and that and such and such?" Um, to me, eight and four would be prob seven and five would be an absolute dirt floor. Eight and four to nine and three looks like a lot better. Uh, ten and two, ten and two probably gets Nebraska the Big Ten title game. Uh, against maybe a Michigan State or an Ohio State, um, I don't think ten to two is out of the realm. I think what I think what needs to happen is that Nebraska needs to get better. Um, Nebraska's defense needs to get better linebacker wise through the season. If that happens, it'll get it will get better. If Nebraska has guys who can step up and be uh, figure out who's going to have the roles like the running back role. Um, if there's a consistent guy there, Nebraska can have be better. If Nebraska can get 10 guys in the offensive line, they're going to be better. There's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, a lot of people call 7-5. and five, A lot of people call 10-2. and two. We really don't know what we're going to get. We're going to find out probably after at the end of the non-conference schedule. Um, the litmus test is probably going to be Miami because BYU, okay, you're going to, everybody's working out the rust and the kinks and trying to figure out what's going on. But uh, definitely it's going to – again, I think 10, I think 10 wins would be a huge success. I think nine wins is a success. Or Nebraska, if you put on 11 with a bowl win, that would just be just the perfect start for Mike Riley. Um, I don't think national championship aspirations or anything like that are honestly true for Nebraska. I just don't. But uh, you put 10 years and 10 wins, 10 regular season wins and a bowl win for Nebraska would be just the absolute perfect season for him. Good stuff. Uh, Brian Tolitz. 
Corn Nation uh, joining us. Great insight, Brian. Always appreciate the time. My pleasure, sir. My pleasure.